Good evening. Buonasera. Uh, it's usual to say it is an honor to be here. All, all speakers always start with this uh, sentence. I must say that I'm really happy to be here, to be back to this wonderful country. Uh, for all people, uh, this land is the land where uh, culture was born, at least our way of thinking was born. So uh, it is uh, always an emotion to be here. And uh, as uh, Harriet says, this is my second time in your country. It was in 20 years, 27 years ago that I was here. At that time I was rather younger, different mentality. So now we appreciate more this visit and uh, the emotion to be near the wall. I told you before that it was a real emotion. And I don't care which kind of God we trust, the wall is a, a real strong emotion. Well, thanks to Kamada, that is a fantastic reality that I enjoyed to visit this morning. I didn't know that they are based in a kibbutz. I was thinking that the kibbutz was a different thing, but it was really nice to learn how they work there and they communicate between people living there and the, the society, the, the company. It's really very nice. It was really one of my best experience in this field. Uh, I'm really proud to speak, to give a talk on uh, an poster. I can call it by name. I think in this country it's allowed to say it because it is an Italian invention. As an Italian, I'm really proud to bring you knowledge in this field. These are my conflicts of interest. As Ariel said, I am a a professor of respiratory medicine, but I am only a clinical pharmacologist. As all clinical pharmacologists, I must interact with companies. And my dearest friend, Barcelli, that you know is American, Italian, Venezuelan, Irish, American person, always says that uh, who has so many conflict of interest has no real conflict of interest. In any case, now I can add the Kamada to this list. And it, if other companies will ask me to be added, uh, I will be really happy about this, of course. Well, starting with my presentation, you know very well that the bronchial trees in the lung contains both large and small airways. Uh, large airways are conducting area that uh, is, it is useful for transport area into the small airways. The small airways represent the respiratory zone where we have the sites of gaseous exchanges. Uh, the majority of bronchial uh, tree generation are made uh, of, up of uh, small airways. Uh, uh, my friend Christian Wirkov told us that about 99% of uh, total lung volume is represented by small airways. And this is an extremely important point because it explains why the deeper in the lungs, the larger the surface area. Is this important? I think it is extremely important. It is extremely important because, because of this uh, finding, the small airways account for only a small fraction of total airway resistance. And uh, this explains why it is extremely difficult to detect abnormalities in this lung region with the normal routine pulmonary function testing. I'm speaking as a, a specialist in respiratory medicine. Uh, I can understand that uh, general practitioners are not used to do this, but even for specialists, it is extremely difficult. But as researchers, I must tell you that uh, fortunately in these last years, we have had the development of newer, modern, accurate, and non-invasive techniques that has allowed us to uh, explore this region. And uh, in this uh, next slide, yeah, I 
am listening, listening the different technique, non-invasive technique that allow us to assess small airway disease. Usually, the simple way is to use spirometry. We focus it on some parameters, of course, not on F1, of course. And I must say that the spirometry is easy to be performed. It is widely available. But we know that it is influenced by large airway obstruction and volume changes. In, uh, as specialists, we can use body plasmography that is also easy to be performed, but the availability is uh, uh, low, although they have a low variability as well. The problem is that the results that we have are still under discussion, and we need for more studies. We have other two very nice uh, techniques, that single breath or the multiple breath nitrogen washout, both have good sensibility and reproducibility, but they are not widely available, and the second one is a, com a very complex technique. Uh, some groups, I think Ariel has this, we have in Tor Vergata as well, uh, use forced oscillation technique, but it is very simple and very reproducible, but unfortunately it is expensive and many hospitals do not like to buy it. So we don't have many uh, machines to, do this, uh, to use this technique. Uh, it's easier to uh, measure exhaled nitrocyte. That's a very important technique because there is no journal variation and it is reprodu reproducible. But we need computational extrapolation to evaluate results. And this is a a really big issue. We can use the prolonged sputum induction mainly if you are focused on the late phase sputum. And this allows direct assessment, but unfortunately, uh, there is poor reproducibility and standardization. At the end, we have high resolution computed tomography. Uh, it allows high resolution, but it has high cost, but mainly. If I ask my ethic committee to give me the permission to perform studies with this technique to assess small airways, they tell me that uh, uh, this technique exposes patients to radiation. And so usually they say, no, you cannot use it. this. That's a big issue that we must always consider. At least in my university, we cannot do anything without ethic committee permission. That's the problem. Recently, uh, the Baker uh, has invented the, a new technique in which the model approach is linked to the, uh, uh, to the imaginary technique. And in this with this method, he is able to link uh, uh, patient-specific HRCT margin to uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics that allows three-dimensional computer model of the highways. With this technique, as you can see, you can uh, obtain insight into the patient-specific airway patterns in the lower airways. And in this manner, you can explore the uh, fates and the position patterns of inhaled drugs. That is extremely useful for understanding where a drug is going. Using these techniques is extremely important. And using this technique, we have understood that at least in asthma, inflammation involves both large airways and small airways. And this is extremely, this is extremely important issue that uh, is explained by the fact that fine particle aeroallergen as you can see, can enter the small airways. If they enter the smaller airways, they can cause inflammation, obstruction, and hyperresponsiveness. And in effect, both by using, uh, uh, here you can see the, uh, the, the um, uh, multiple breath nitrogen washout after the metacoline test, but even better if you use 
eighth HRCT. Uh, you can see how uh, you have a differences. This, is very, this part is extremely important because you can see that if you expose highways to cut allergens, you do not detect F1 changes, but you can see important changes in uh, HRCT. Uh, I think that uh, if we could show this to members of uh, our ethics committee, probably they will understand how important this technique is. But again, the high costs do not allow us to use this in a routinary manner. But if we have an involvement of inflammatory involvement of small airways, well, we must uh, think that uh, uh, this chronic inflammation can also thicken the wall of the small airways, and in this uh, in this manner. Uh, we have a remodeling of small airways, not only of bronchi and bronchioles. And this is a extremely important point. In fact, you can see that if you measure closing volume in patients suffering from severe asthma, well, you can find a higher closing volume to vital capacity ratio, and these results can suggest small airways disease. But what is really, sorry, I don't know what happened. What is extremely intriguing is the fact that even in mild asthma, mild asthma, usually the patients that do not come to our outpatient office if they are not really suffering from asthmatic crises, well, but if they come and you can perform a platysmography, you can see that the peripheral resistance is significantly increased, even with a normal lung function. And in effect, small airways impairment is present in more than 60% of treated asthma patients. And without any differences uh, across asthma severity, as you can see. And even without uh, any differences, uh, uh, or regardless, if you want, of uh, the treatment, the level of uh, disease control and treatment, as you can see. Please, mainly general practitioners, don't forget that small airway impairment correlates with the worse asthma control and increased desacerbation. There is very solid documentation in literature showing these two important things. And uh, what is good is to note that if we stabilize asthma, well, we can record an improvement of small airway obstruction. So it means that in our asthmatic patients, small airways this is, is something that we must always, always bear in mind and we must always uh, treat without hesitation. What about uh, COPD? Well, also in COPD, we have a small airway obstruction. This is a very nice cartoon published by Peter Barnes in which this uh, uh, finding has been documented. The airways wall is, uh, Peter's wrote maybe, but I could say is, thickened by an inflammatory cell infiltrate, mainly macrophages, neutrophils, and B and T lymphocytes. There are structural changes, I don't know what happened, with the, um, increased, the, is, there is mainly a, Increase the thickness of airways smooth muscle and fibrosis. And also, what is also very intriguing, there is, uh, at least in severe disease, lymphoid follicles. But we know that also the lumen is uh, uh, occluded by mucus secretions. And also there is an alveolar attachment that are disrupted because of reduced elasticity. 
no, that, okay. Occlusion of small airways by inflammatory accidents, as you can see, that contain mucus is associated with early death in patients with severe emphysema. And in effect, Marina Saet, a group that was focused on these important issues, documented that we can have a leukocyte infiltration in small airways of smokers with severe COPD, but also in a smoker with mild COPD, although the extension of inflammation is different, of course. Uh, Jim Hoggs has published, I, know, I think that you know him very well, has published a fundamental paper. In this paper, he was able, with his group, to document that the progression of COPD is strongly associated with an increase in the volume of tissue in the wall of small airways and accumulation of inflammatory mucus exercise in their lumen. And... Uh, uh, the extent of the inflammatory response uh, as uh, reflected by the number of uh, airways containing acute inflammatory cells, uh, uh, PNN, um, I don't know, uh, macrophages and eosinophils, and also uh, lymphocytes, CD4, CD8, and B cells, organized into follicles, as I said before, is associated with the disease progression. And uh, the same group was also able to document that the number of small airways per lung pair was reduced in patients with mild gold stage one uh, COPD as compared with control. And there was a further reduction in patients with the severe or very severe COPD, gold 3 or 4. Uh, is this an important issue? Yes, this is an important issue because we know that peripheral airways obstruction traps air during expiration. And this brings to, this leads to hyperinflation. And uh, Using the impulse oscillatory system of measurement, we are able to document a correlation, a significant correlation, between the uh, damage in the small airways, this is an index of small airways uh, damage, and uh, health status, at least as uh, expressed by the San George Respiratory Questionnaire Total Score. So, it's clear that small airway obstruction is an important issue. And if it is an important issue, we must treat it. Uh, what we can find in the small airway obstruction is inflammation, remodeling, and smooth muscle contraction. We can contrast smooth muscle contraction by using LABA, long acting beta two agonist. We can contrast inflammation by use in other corticosteroids. And likely, although there are some doubts on this, in other corticosteroids can influence remodeling. It means that ICS lab combination could be the gold standard for influencing this disease. In effect, in asthma, as you know very well, looking at the Gina guidelines, we can see that the ICS lab combination are central in the treatment of this disease. What in COPD? Well, in COPD, uh, we have uh, surely a very good results by using LABAS, because LABAS induce bronchodilation, as you know. But we know that ICS uh, are not really effective as anti-inflammatory agents when used alone. But we know that corticosteroids increase the expression of uh, beta-2 uh, receptors and may restore reduced beta-2 receptors number. Don't forget that if you use labelon, you can have in the first instance 
tachyphylaxis, and after tolerance, that is a reduction of the response to the beta-2 agonist. So this is extremely important to restore the response to beta-2 agonist. But on the other side, LABA may restore responsiveness to corticosteroid. There is very elegant uh, research uh, done by the group of Peter Barnes documenting that uh, formoterol is able to restore the sensibility to inhaled corticosteroid. My question is, if this is the case, when must I use an inhaled corticosteroid? I think that this is a crucial question. Well, I don't trust, I was discussing be, before with my chair about the uh, gold recommendation. They are not good uh, guidelines, they are just recommendation. And uh, I told him, and he think, agrees with me, that uh, gold are not really guidelines and are not really a realistic approach to the treatment of the COPD. Likely because COPD is a disorder more than a disease, or at least is a disease with different phenotypes. For this reason, I trust that the Spanish approach published by Mark Miravillas is much, much more appropriate to treat our patients. In this uh, algorithm, as you can see, they recognize uh, ACOS. Again, I don't know if ACOS really exists or not. We could discuss all night about this, uh, but they have introduced ACOS, and they say that we should use, they recognize the other two phenotypes, emphysema and chronic bronchitis, as at the Buros time, to be honest. But they also divide these two phenotypes in those who in patients that are frequent exacerbators, two or more uh, moderate or severe exacerbation per year, or no moderate or non frequent exacerbator, with less than two uh, moderate or severe exacerbation per year. According to this algorithm, ICS LABA should be used in B, C, and D group. Well, this is true. Probably this is what we do in real life. But I must admit that at least in patients with, that have a, a emphysema, predominant emphysema, without exacerbations, we don't use inhaled corticosteroid because in this group, inhaled corticosteroids are not useful. But as you can see in this uh, paper by Lee, published in uh, respiratory medicine, and I take the responsibility of having published this paper because I was the associate editor that accepted it. You can see that in mild mixed COPD, in obstruction dominant COPD, and severe mixed COPD, ICS are extremely effective in improving, at least improving FPV1. Last year, Elgo Magnussen at the ERS Congress just in the same day in which the paper was published in New England, uh, presented the data coming from the wisdom study that I think you know very well, at least specialists know very well. In this trial, they were able to document that the progressive withdrawal of inhaled corticosteroid didn't change the risk of having exacerbations in the patients uh, uh, suffering from uh, uh, moderate severe COPD that were in triple therapy. But in these patients, the withdrawal of uh, uh, inhaled corticosteroid after 12 weeks of uh, progressive withdrawal induced a faster decline in FV1. And there was a worst quality of life in these patients, as you can see in this cartoon. For this reason, I was looking at what was present in literature. We have just published a paper in drugs uh, entitled Escalation and Escalation Treatment in COPD. So to explain this data, we have a look at, at the COSMIC study that I think you remember very well. The COSMIC study told us that if your patients is uh, suffering from an FU, uh, COPD with an FU1 that is between 30 and 70% predicted, 
a history of at least two COPD exacerbation in the last year, treated with the course of oral steroid and or antibiotic, well, you can withdraw in our corticosteroid without increasing the risk of exacerbation when compared with the patients that continue to have in our corticosteroid. This is not true when the patient is suffering from an FP1 less than 50% predicted. But in all population, when you stop to administer in our corticosteroid, you have a faster decline in FP1. For this reason, I completely agree with Relly that wrote the editorial to the wisdom study that probably we must consider a new paradigm for COPD treatment. And uh, we must move from uh, the concept that uh, we must treat the patients with inhaled corticosteroid uh, because of exacerbation, whereas the use of uh, glucocorticoid therapy uh, in patients who are also taking long-acting bronchodilator should be based on symptomatic improvement that is used by the glucocorticoid rather than on the prevention of exacerbation. This is completely new concept that uh, all results coming from literature and even from everyday activity seems to document. The problem is that uh, Ariel Friend, Sammy Suisa, told us that if we use inhaled corticosteroid, we increase the risk of pneumonia. To be honest, uh, I think I have treated uh, thousand patients, several thousand patients with uh, ceratide, but there's uh, semicort and so on, Foster in Italy as well, and never I have recorded a pneumonia, to be honest. But I must honestly admit as a researcher that uh, there is evidence for increased pneumonia risk. Uh, there is a biological link through inhibition of NFKB by an corticosteroid. Uh, there are several large prospective trials that report increased pneumonia associated with the ICS use. There is case control study showing increased risk of pneumonia hospitalization with the ICS use. And there are two separate meta-analyses showing increased risk of pneumonia associated with ICS in pool analysis. No question. But what Sam did not tell us is that we have also evidence against. Uh, in vitro in vivo studies using ICS show reduced bacterial invasion. Clinical trials were not designed to assess pneumonia risk and no radiographic confirmation of pneumonia was in the majority of these trials reporting pneumonia. ICS was not identified as an independent risk factor for pneumonia in a population-based study. Meta-analysis restricted to betosanide trials did not find a link with the pneumonia, and I don't, treat, I don't trust that uh, uh, betosanide is different from fluticasone or from in this case as risk, I mean, because the pharmacological activity is always the same. And the failure of trials and meta-analysis to control for antibiotic use in the treatment and control groups, uh, this, is, this is a clear indication that uh, ICS do not induce uh, pneumonia. After, I, will, I would like to know your opinion. That's the similar important. Because you have, I am sure that you have discussed with Sammy about this point. Well, but if I use inhaled corticosteroid, where are steroid receptors located? This is, was a paper published by Jan Adcock uh, that still worked with Peter Barnes at the Imperial College in London. And uh, he and Peter were able to document that the highest concentration of glucocorticosteroid uh, receptor, MRA, is present in the alveolar holes, as you can see. Vascular endothelium, surely. Vascular muscular uh, smooth muscles, surely. Epithelial, uh, airway epithelium and inflammatory cells, no question. But alveolar holes, look. Where beta-2 adrenal receptors are located? This is not my paper, but uh, my group is uh, uh, now really focused uh, in uh, precision cut lung slice. This is a, a, a very nice method to explore 
uh, small airways in using in human tissue. If somebody wants to come to Rome, can learn this technique in my lab. There is no question. You will be welcome. And uh, uh, even Cooper documented that uh, the bronchoconstriction of uh, small airways, you can see in this case, you can see the change in the caliber of uh, airways uh, using the precision cut lung slice in response to carbacol that you know contract airways is reversed by beta-2 agonists, in this case isoprotenol, supporting the presence of uh, beta-2 adrenal receptors in small airways, in distal uh, lung. Is this important? This is a very important pharmacological issue. I think it is extremely important because, at least in theory, but even in practice, we know that uh, we must use LABAS with high efficacy, high intrinsic activity. You know that isoprotenol is one, for motor is 0.96, and going down up to salmeterol and bilanterol, that is 0.7, at least according to some, uh, uh, some, some reports. We have published in Blue Journal a review on beta-2 agonists, and we have reported a table with these results. Well, if we use a high efficacy lab in an area where there is a high density of beta-2 receptors, we have the highest enhancement of uh, glucocorticoid glucocorticoid response element dependent transcription. So the best response. Whereas if you lose a low efficacy LABA in a area with low beta-2 receptor density, you have the lowest uh, transcription. So I must get small airways. There's no question. For all I've told you, but we know that we have some factors that are fundamental in influencing the lung deposition in medical aerosols. Obviously, we must look at the patient's factors, such as inhalation maneuver. We must have very good nurses that help us to educate our patients in uh, considering a good inspired volume, inspired flow, breath hold pause, and also we must consider the severity of uh, airway disease, we must uh, consider the device acceptance, no compliance, no absorption of the drug, of course, uh, and this is an extremely important point. But, on the other side, it is extremely important to look at the aerosol characteristics. We have several part, uh, characteristics that are important, but what is more important is the particle size. Why this is the most important issue? Because we know that uh, large particles more likely deposit in the oropharyngeal than in smaller uh, airways. Whereas the smaller particles can go down uh, because of the laminar uh, airflow. And uh, what in uh, lab we are able to see is that uh, the particle size influence the total and regional site of airway drug deposition. Usually, most inhalers use, uh, that we use in clinical practice have a particle size uh, in the range of 2 to 6, that is the respirable range. Small particles achieve a larger, greater lung deposition and uh, small airway disposition, as you can see here, compared to 6 to one micromole, in, then larger uh, particles. And this picture is extremely didactic and really show what we can see. What about ICS particle size? There is now solid, very solid documentation that uh, ICS particle size depends upon the formulation. You, in this country, you told me that uh, you are using a DPI, this is the uh, mass median aerodynamic diameter. Look at what you can have with the uh, uh, HFS solution uh, uh, delivered by MDI. Look at the part. This is the Italian invention, Modulite, Modulite technology. 
The modular technology has changed our way of thinking about the position, the possibility of uh, release drugs in the small airways. This is uh, an effective replacement of CFC-based drug delivery systems that combines easy to use of a PMDI with the currency of DPI dosing. I so understand why you are using DPI dosing because of the currency, but we know that MDI is more easy to use. This technology also offers many advantages over CFC-based MDI, DPI, and even HFA suspension-based MDI, because it enables the size and distribution of particles to be modulated. This is the reason of the name Modulite. Uh, it allows the size and distribution of particles to be tailored, enabling drug delivery to the targeted to different parts of the lung. It has led to development of super fine particle HFA solution systems, which allow for deeper penetration into the smaller airways of the lungs. And a super fine formulation is defined as having a mixture of, of ultra fine with a diameter of less than uh, uh, 100 nanomolar and extra fine uh, diameter less, less than one micromolar particles. The optimization of particle size and total quantity of fine particles can be performed independently to the lack of interaction between the different parameters. And this is a extremely important point that all other devices do not have. Here you can see a very nice study that uh, has been published in primary pharmacology and therapeutics documenting the differences between CFC uh, beclomethasone dipropionate, a medium-sized particle, 800 microgram, and uh, HFA uh, beclomethasone dipropionate, ultra-fine particle, 400 microgram, and you can see that the second one induced greater improvement in uh, impulsometry or shimmering system index that, as I said before, we think uh, can reflect small airway disease. Look, I have a co they have compared 800 microgram with 400 microgram, and these are the differences in the results. In effect, extra fine uh, uh, beclomethasone, even when combined uh, with the formoterol in a fixed dose combination, allow a high lung deposition, not only in large airways, but also in small airways. And this both in asthmatic patients and in COPD patients. We have about 33% of lung deposition. Tell me which kind of device you know that can allow this type, of, this amount of deposition. I think that you have no one that is able to do this. And uh, all what I have told you could be story. Uh, as physicians, we want to see what uh, we think can happen. And uh, the, using the, the Becker uh, methodology, it was possible to see that the acute administration of uh, uh, beclomethasone, dipropionate, uh, fluticasone, uh, extra fine fixed dose combination, was able to improve airway volume in small airways compared to large, uh, uh, to large airways after treatment. The red color indicated the, grit, the greatest uh, improvement. And even if you treat it, uh, your patients is in a regular manner, in a chronic manner, you can see that you can uh, have a greater airway volume change of, uh, induced by this combination on small airways when compared to large airways. So I think that you can trust me when I say that with this drug, we can have an important improvement in the small airways obstruction. Considering all these things, uh, extra fine beclomethasone, fluticasone, 
has been tested in uh, several trials, even in pivotal studies. I want to just show you in asthmatic patients this, this comparison between uh, bacromethasone dipropionate uh, for motorol and the fluticasone propionate salmitrol. Uh, looking at the change in ethyl, we see that is an indirect method to explore small airways, very, very indirect method, but still a useful method. And you see the important differences that you can observe between the two treatment in power or bacromethasone fluticasone propionate. And uh, uh, this approach, this therapeutic approach, also induces a greater asthma control than the larger particle uh, budesonide, uh, bacromethasone dipropionate fluticasone. The asthma control is defined as a non-nocturnal awakening, no asthma symptoms, no rescue medication. And also uh, provides great asthma control versus uh, all larger particle ICS lab, both budesonide uh, for motorol and fluticasone salmitrol, as you can see. Looking at the daytime symptoms, looking at the rescue medication, looking at the asthma, total asthma control. What in COPD? I like a lot of this uh, imaging. This is a extremely attractive imagine, not because of the colors, but because colors tell us that there is an important change in uh, lobar volume at the log, a total lung capacity that for a pathophysiologist is extremely important index of uh, reduction in hyperinflation. That means an important activity of small airways. After six month treatment, with the extra fine bacromethasone uh, for motorol compared with the pre bronchodilator uh, baseline. You have this effect soon after the treatment, six hours after, four, six hours after bronchodilation, but even after six months treatment, it is even more important. It is not a surprise, therefore, that the forward study that was published by Visha Vishika in respiratory medicine last year was able to document that uh, this combination, when compared with uh, formodorol alone, was able to induce a Im really important change in uh, traffic V1 in the morning, predose morning F1. Look at the difference. I'm comparing a bronchodilator with uh, ICS lab. Look at the importance, if always statistically significant. But what was important in the forward study was the documentation that combining uh, bacromethasone dipropionate for motor versus for motor alone, there was a delay in the time of, to first COPD exacerbation. In asthma, there is no question. If I use uh, ICS, I can delay the exacerbation, the asthma exacerbation. This is not so clear in COPD. It's not so obvious in COPD. Here you can see that when compared with the formotor alone, you have so important effect. After uh, Peter Calverly uh, performed another study, another one year, almost one year, 48 weeks uh, study, in which he compared uh, bacromethasone dipropionate formotor of 424 micrograms a day with budesonide formotor 800 micrograms twice a daily, and for motorol 24 microgram a day. You can see that uh, after 48 week treatment, 400 microgram, that is 212 microgram if you want, uh, or 169, it depends as you can uh, consider the formulation delivered or uh, 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 as delivered source. You can see the important differences in favor of this uh, dosage. And uh, uh, in the study of uh, Peter uh, uh, Calverly, it was also able to document an important improvement in FVC, that's, as I said before, as is an indirect uh, index of uh, an impact on small airways, that reflected an important improvement in six minute walking test. As clinician, as pneumologist, 
I trust a lot this result. Because in my experience, I'm a very old doctor now, unfortunately, what I've seen in these 45 years of my activity as specialist in respiratory medicine is that the most important point in our COPD patients is not to delay exacerbations, but to improve their capacity to perform exercise. Everyday activities, for example. That's an extremely important issue. And what has been uh, documented by Peter Carverly was also observed in a small study performed by Alfredo Ketta, that is full professor of respiratory medicine in Parma, where case is based. But uh, it was only by chance that he was performed, this study was performed in, uh, in Parma. Uh, Alfredo and his group was able to document that when buiclometasone on the propionate for motorol, 200 microgram, 12 microgram twice daily, was compared with fruticasone propionate salmitrol, 250 microgram, 50 microgram twice daily. I know that this is not the dosage that we use in Europe, I think even here, for treating COPD because we use 500 microgram, uh, 50 microgram uh, in this combination. Well, but using this, that is the American dosage, to be honest, uh, he was able to, they were able to record an improvement in uh, uh, baseline lung function parameters that had a very important impact on uh, traditional disciplinary index score. I don't know if you trust the TDI. This was an index that was prepared by Don Muller. Um, I can know that FDA is criticizing this index. In fact, we are preparing a new document on how to come in COPD, in which we will stress this concept. But to the best of my knowledge, at the present time, this index is much better than other indexes that we could use. I think that my sp uh, colleagues that are specialized in respiratory medicine completely agree with me because this is what we really use in, uh, in our everyday activity. Another very interesting paper has been published by David Singh. In, the same, in this study, also he was comparing, in this case, again, uh, beclometasone dipropionate with uh, for, uh, plus uh, formotol against fluticasone propionate and salmitero. And you can see that uh, they were able to observe a very interesting change in lung function, as you can see at the baseline and after uh, three months treatment that had a very important impact on TDI and on San George Respiratory Questionnaire. Why I am presenting this study? Because I think that more than be focused on lung function, when we observe the results of treatments in COPD patients, we must be mainly uh, focused on patients reported the heart because patients reported outcomes tell us really what is the feeling of our patients. And if our patients report an improvement in dyspnea, improvement in his or her quality of life, he or she will remain compliant with the prescribed treatment. The issue that we have is that with prescribed treatment, mainly as specialists, usually we see the patients after four, five, six months, and usually they stop to take the drug because they believe that the drug do not work if they don't perceive a improvement in these parameters. What is important, again, is patient's reported outcome. In conclusion, what are my take-home messages? I don't know if you agree with me, but I think that all my presentation has clearly documented that these salary weight abnormalities are found early in the course of asthma and COPD. And look, I am stressed early. That means that mainly general practitioners that can visit patients, can see patients in an early stage must consider this important issue. Small airway dysfunction contributes to air flow limitation because of inflammation, because of remodeling, because of airway smooth muscle constriction, both in asthma and COPD. Small airway dysfunction uh, causes uh, relevant outcomes, clinical outcomes in asthma and COPD. Mainly, I say in COPD, 
uh, reduction in the capacity of performing exercise and uh, to, uh, also they induce severe dyspnea. I think that these findings provide a rationale for an early therapy targeting these airways. I have documented that extra fine formulation display improved the position in the small airways. And I think that both small particle steroids and small particle ICS LABA combination give added clinical benefits in our patients. I am really happy to tell this because this is what we really do in my outpatient office. So I am happy to report exactly what we do. And I can tell you that we are completely satisfied by using this, uh, this approach. I hope that uh, you will discuss this, this. And if you want, I will tell you more about this combination. Thank you very much.